Good, good morning, everyone. Um, hello and welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheist, agnostic, skeptic, free thinker, non-believer, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. And now, on to our creed. Seattle Atheist Church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics, which commits us, on the one hand, to reason and evidence-based thinking, and on the other, to compassion for our fellow human beings. These commitments motivate us to oppose magical and wishful thinking and all forms of dogma, as well as to stand firmly against all forms of prejudice. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to other conscious beings, and we believe in good. Because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, you're probably in the right place. Okay, so today we are very honored to have a special guest with us. Um, we had been in circle when we were together last and also last week even, the subject just keeps coming up um, that we would love to have more diversity in our church. And so the question of the, you know, what's going on? Why are we not seeing uh, black atheists? And um, also as a separate question, why, or, you know, also we would like to see more women in church. So um, luckily, um, Mandisa Thomas agreed uh, to talk with us. She's the co-founder of Black Nonbelievers. And in 2013, she was a principal, one of the principal organizers of Blackout Secular Rally. Uh, for uh, celebrating non-believers of color. She's on the board of American Atheists and she has held board positions on Foundation Beyond Belief, the Secular Coalition for America, and the 2016 Reason Rally. So um, we are honored to have you, Mandisa. And then I turn over uh, the floor to you. Good morning slash afternoon, everyone. Um, how's everyone doing once again this this afternoon? Great. Good, good. So there were a few things that were left out of my bio, which I am not sure where that came from, because most of that is correct. Um, I am the founder and president of the organization as it is right now. Um, and uh, just to give some background on me, for those of you who aren't familiar, I see quite a few of our representatives, our members, and our organizers on this on this uh, hangout, on this video conference this afternoon slash morning, and I appreciate them, and I appreciate everyone who is here. It's always an honor to speak with folks um, whenever I um, whenever I engage, and this is a bit of an adjustment for all of us. So. Um, but I like to be as engaging as I am usually in person. So just to give some background on me, I am a native of New York City. I was born and raised there. And I am 43 years old, soon to be 44. And so I was born during a time where there was a transition within the black community, especially in New York. Um, there was a sense of, there was more of a sense of identity with black culture and being Afrocentric and black pride. And part of that included a number of black folks who were doing away with traditional Christianity. And so my parents fell into that category. Um, they wanted, they did not want my, my, my siblings and I to be raised in the church. So therefore my upbringing and the upbringing of my, my brothers was pretty non-religious. I was actually raised in what is called the Black Conscious Community. And, um, and so with that, I, um, 
I've learned a lot about Black history and culture growing up, as well as um, institutional racism and injustice that were committed that were committed against the injustices that were committed against Black folks and other marginalized groups. However, I did have experiences with being in church buildings because. I, my, my mother placed me in voice lessons. I had vocal training from the age I was, uh, from the age of four, and I sang in various churches. And so I sort of got a peripheral view or an understanding of religion and the church within the Black community and with the education and information I received that I, when I was younger, I started questioning very early um, you know, the, the existence of a God or especially um, the God within Christianity, as well as how it pertained to the Black community. And as time went on, though, um, I remember the first time I, I was asked if I was atheist, and that was when I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And by that time, I was a pretty outspoken teenager. And um, when I when I um, when that question was posed to me, I asked, "What did that mean?" And I was told that I didn't believe in heaven or hell. And when I thought about it, I said, "Well, that sounds about right," because over the years um, I had contemplated the existence of heaven or hell, but could never reconcile it because there was never any, there wasn't any evidence of anyone returning from the dead. There was never anything sufficient um, to justify belief in an afterlife or the existence of a heaven or hell. But over the years, um, I, I resorted to saying I was spiritual but not religious because I definitely did not believe in Christianity. Over the years, I did attend a few church services, but never so much to the point where I felt like I absolutely had to belong to any of, um, to any of those communities. And so upon moving with my family to Atlanta at the end of 1997, one of the first questions that I found that I was asked something that I was never asked in New York was what church do I go to? And that was quite odd for me. I mean, I, I had the sense that the South was, you know, a Bible belt because I had heard that phrase before and I had visited the South before, but it was never so overwhelming um, to be asked that question. But over the years, um, you know, as, as uh, my family grew and as uh, we were raising our children in the South, uh, my, my husband and I, um, I, have in, I had encountered, we had encountered quite a few people and we were invited to various church services and we just always, um, you know, we just always kind of backed off on that. But I remember in 2008, from 2008 to 2010, I really started, really started um, voicing my dissatisfaction and my dissent with the church in particular. At that time, I wasn't ready to call myself an atheist or re-identify as an atheist because it still felt a little weird to me, but I certainly started um, expressing my dissatisfaction with the church in particular, as well as um, Christianity and, and people that I knew. Um, and so it was in that time of reevaluating my position, as well as becoming more acquainted with social media and connecting with first Black atheists online. Um, and then I, one of the first people I met was Jeremiah Kamara, who um, Ruth and I spoke about um, uh, during our initial conversation, and I will be sharing more information on him in a bit. Um, so when upon my connecting with um, atheists online and continuing to reevaluate my stance, I eventually re-identified as atheist because that was pretty much where I stood. You know, I, I, I reflected on my upbringing and what I learned and also my experiences. And that was the conclusion that, that, that I 
that I came to was that I didn't believe in any of it at all. And it was, it was nothing to be afraid of. And so I liberated myself from that, from that fear. You know, I consider myself fortunate to never have, to never have had to, um, you know, let go of the religious indoctrination. But there is still a fear that you overcome even when you're raised non-religious, especially when you're in a community where it surrounds you almost 24 seven. And so, um, but when I um, engaged in offline community, um, I saw what some other black atheists had communicated to me in discussions on, on social media platforms. They expressed a discomfort with attending in-person atheist events or secular events because for one, they were predominantly white, but not just that, there were other issues that came along with that. And so during the course of this discussion, I will explain what those are. And after attending my first um, atheist secular meetup in the Atlanta area in January of 2011, though it was a great experience, there was still something very polarizing about it. And it was confirmed that there was a need to create a network um, starting in the, in the metro Atlanta area that helped bring out, increase the visibility and build up the community of black folks who were atheists or who were questioning their religious beliefs in favor of leaving. So with that, Black Nonbelievers of Atlanta was co-founded. And so in, in February of that year, we held our first meeting. Uh, we had started um, connecting with folks with other groups in the local area. And eventually we connected with a few national organizations. We connected with enough people within our group um, who expressed interest in facilitating groups in their cities. And so eventually we got to the point where we were able to expand um, na nationwide. And so we did that at the end of 2011. And um, to, and so in almost 10 years, um, we have grown to an extent that we are now the largest network, uh, recognized network of black atheists, agnostics, humanists, and et cetera. And that is something I'm very proud of uh, because there was, there is still a lot of work being put into that and it's ongoing. And so the question, to answer the question as to why there may be a lack of diversity or inclusion within your groups, this is something that has actually been asked over the course of some years. And um, sometimes we feel like, I've, sometimes I feel like a broken record, but as people come into what we now know as the atheist movement or the secular community, um, we realize that there are, there are some people who may come and go. There are some people who have never had to consider things from other perspectives. And so these points bear repeating. And so the first thing that needs to be understood is that the black atheist demographic is larger than you think. There are more of us out here than you may realize, but the issues are as such. For one, that the black community overall is still highly religious and this is verified by the Pew Research numbers. It's still at about 80% of the black community that identifies as religious, even though the black community makes up about 12% of the United States population. So those are high numbers. Secondly, though, the atheist slash secular community and most of its leadership is still predominantly white and it is still predominantly white centered. And this is a problem for a number of reasons because it almost presents itself as if first of all, that there are fewer 
atheists of color, whether they are Black, Latino, or Latinx, or et cetera, and also that there are fewer women um, because much of the information that is provided and most of the leadership is centered around white males. And this is something that even though there are a number, a, a few of your major organizations like American Atheists and the Freedom From Religion Foundation were founded by women, there is still an overwhelmingly imbalanced representation in this community of white men and older white men. And this is something that people should be paying more attention to. And secondly, I know that this is called the Seattle Atheist Church, which I think if it works for your members, if it, if it helps to be, you know, if it helps to put church in your name, um, then okay. There's certainly, there's certainly a good variety. Um, there's, there, there's something to be said about variety. However, for many Black atheists in particular, the church model can be extremely off-putting. First of all, for someone who wasn't raised in church, I certainly would not want to attend an organ, uh, events with an organization that sort of models itself after that. That would be, you know, that would, I would hesitate, even though I would be looking for more information on it. That certainly may not be comforting to all of us and even those who have left the church. So that is something to consider. But also, what tends to happen when Black atheists or atheists of color come into predominantly white spaces and predominantly white secular spaces? And I'm not going to say that this is the case for everyone because there are quite a few Black atheists who are comfortable in these spaces. So I don't, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but I will speak to the majority of our membership and people who I have spoken to, is that many of the members, even, uh, even the, many of the members in these organizations, even though there is no ill intent, there is a tendency for white atheists to um, tend to, they, they tend to still center their whiteness um, in, the, in the presence of, of black atheists and atheists of color. And there seems to be so much excitement about having a person of color in their space that um, there is, you know, there, there are people who tend to harp on, you know, the harp on the attendees and will ask them questions that they are expected to answer on behalf of either the entire demographic or the entire black community in general. And um, that is a form of tokenization. You're expecting for these very few participants of color to be able to answer all of the questions that you have and you're putting, you're putting not only, you're putting emotional labor on them, you're, you're putting labor on them that they did not ask for and that they don't deserve because what that tends to imply is that our skepticism and our ability to research and understand just stops at the the god concept you know there tends to be this this laziness if you will um when it comes to um when it comes to understanding what different communities go through and the experiences do vary because as a black atheist um you are sort of we are sort of holding this identity on our shoulders because we're also dealing with institutionalized racism and injustice we also have to acknowledge the role that the church played um, at one time in history but we also have to contend with the institutional factors and how damaging a number of factors have been. And it seems that a lot of white, uh, non-black or non-POC atheists, um, it seems like there is a, you know, there is a tendency to dismiss what we go through. And so, and institutionally. 
and there there's often this sense of you know dismissiveness as to well i don't understand how you people can still or your people can still believe in that without without having done any research on their own and there also seems to be this this um this idea that we're just supposed to be the only ones to provide this information so when that happens in your spaces that can be a complete turnoff and also when there is very little representation whether you know of you know the work and the activism of black atheists or not when there is no representation or very little in your spaces that can also be a turnoff and so what we sought to rectify within that with uh, forming black nonbelievers. And I will say that we weren't the only organization around when we got started. You also had black, there was also Black Atheists of America, which was its own uh, standalone organization. You had African Americans for Humanism, which was a subsidiary of the Center for Inquiry. Uh, you also have Black Skeptics Los Angeles, uh, which is based out of um, uh, the Los Angeles area. And I'm going to speak on the founder uh, in just the, in a few moments. And uh, so there were there were a few entities out there that were dispensing information that specifically reached out to the Black atheist demographic and that sought to um, bring out that visibility and representation because there is also historic representation within the black community as well. And I will say that there have been major organizations that have, um, that have spotlit um, black atheists and humanists and et cetera. But as far as there being a, con a concerted effort to actually focus and target uh, that, uh, that demographic, um, there was none until our organizations came into existence. Uh, so that was what we as an organization, and we only sought to do it in Atlanta because we knew that there were other organizations out there. However, uh, my background as an event, um, an event services manager, which, um, you know, which brought together my, uh, my ability to, to manage and also it it also um i also have a customer service background so we became uh, very event based and we are very event based uh we were very um you know we're 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 um we're a proponent of outreach and the focus was on your everyday people those who were you know dealing with was struggling with either coming out to their family members and friends and looking for others who could identify and were looking for community and those who weren't necessarily in tune with the overall secular community but who needed to know that there were other organizations and other people out there because there is a sense of isolation that many atheists overall feel but definitely black atheists in particular. So um, the mission of our organization was to show that there are more of us, that we are not alone, and that there are also a number of people who could potentially get involved with the community. And so we've been, like I said before, we've been going strong now for almost 10 years. And we started, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we, we are headquartered in the Atlanta, Georgia area. This is where we got started. And if you go to our website, which I will type here right now, um, you can see that we have affiliate groups across the country. And um, so, yes, um, we have been very active. And in addition to serving on the board for American Atheists, I also do serve on the board for the American Humanist Association and formerly for Foundation Beyond Belief, as well as the Secular Coalition for America and the Reason Rally Coalition. And a huge part of our work is built around coalition building. Uh, we do connect with the other secular organizations locally and nationally, 
And the reason why we are a part of, we are a member organization of the Secular Coalition for America, because again, that representation is important. And to show that we are also aren't the only organization that is focused on a specific demographic because the entire community cannot just handle, it is, um, you know, something that we've heard over the years is that why does there need to be a group called Black Nonbelievers? Um, because for one, and there is, we unapologetically center the voices of Black atheists and those who are questioning religion. There is no, there are, there are very few organizations who do it and we just couldn't wait for them to start. That has improved over the years, but, and also when it comes to the experiences and being able to relate to what we go through in our own communities, uh, we can definitely speak to what that's like. There, are, and also you will find that the subject matter does vary. There does tend to be more of a focus on racial injustice, economic injustice, how certain communities are impacted in ways that go beyond simply just not believing in a God, how that has impacted the Black community in general, how that had, and, and also how that impacts us as Black atheists. So we're dealing with a number of, we're, we're dealing with multiple factors here. And it was up to us to try to turn that around. And we've been able, I'm, I'm happy to say that we've done that through not just in-person events, whether locally or nationally, we've also been able to provide input for other organizations. Um, we have contributed to now a number of literary, um, literary works, and I will be sharing some of those links um, as we go along. I'm going to hold up for any of you who are uh, members of the American Humanist Association, you may have received this copy of the July and August 2018 issue, or you may have been able to purchase it at your local Barnes and Noble. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this edition is now almost two years old, and it features myself and a few of my colleagues in the movement. Um, and the title of the issue was The Five Fierce Humanist. Um, you know, un unapologetic Black women beyond belief. And this is the first time that multiple Black atheist humanist women have been featured on the cover of a magazine. Now, from what I understand, the American Humanist Association also um, featured um, Alice, they, they featured Alice Walker. They honored her as their humanist of the year, one year. And she was on their cover. Um, American Atheists also had um, Dr. Anthony Penn on their cover. Um, it, that was a few years ago. But um, as far as where the movement has gone, um, that we've been able to actually put something into writing. And I just shared the, I just shared the Amazon link to Candace Gorm's book, The Ebony Exodus Project, in case, um, you know, and, and, and I'd, I'd highly, I highly recommend um, uh, researching and reading that book. This is the latest, this is the most recent release from Dr. Sakibu Hutchinson. It's called Humanists in the Hood. And there are multiple references to Black nonbelievers. She is the founder um, and executive director of Black Skeptics Los Angeles. And there are multiple references to us as well as Candace's book and a number of a number of books and events that have now taken place um, within the secular community that um, we have that Black Nonbelievers and Black Skeptics Los Angeles has facilitated. For example, the Women of Color Beyond Belief Conference that took place, the first one took place last year. We are still hoping that it can take place this year in September. But of course, the current circumstances will um, determine whether that can still take place in person. Um, we also have uh, a number of 
Uh, as I said before, I connected with Jeremiah Kamara, and uh, he's actually, you know, one of my one of my favorite people now. And uh, he's been featured at a number of our events. And I'm going to link you to his most recent documentary called Holy Hierarchy, The Religious Roots of Racism, which I encourage everyone to view if they can. It's available on Amazon Prime. And also there is a historic component to Black humanism and atheism that um, I encourage everyone to um, I'm posting the link to Christopher Cameron's book, uh, Black Freethinkers, A History of African American Secularism. Um, and we featured him at, um, we featured him at quite a few of our events, uh, not a quite a few, but a number of our events. He's a member of uh, our Charlotte affiliate group. And so, and also, if you are familiar with, um, Tony, uh, Dr. Anthony Penn, who will, he does, uh, he doesn't mind being referred to as Tony. Um, I'm, I'm uh, linking you to his most recent book, which is called When Color Blindness Isn't the Answer, Humanism and the Challenge of Race. And this is something that I will uh, expound upon for a moment. And this also will lead me into how your groups, your predominantly white secular groups can improve upon your diversity and inclusion efforts. So one of the things that we often hear is, well, I don't see race, we're all one race. Race isn't, you know, race is a social construct, which is true, but I highly recommend you watching Jeremiah Kamara's uh, film, Holy Hierarchy, to further understand how the concept of race came about. Um, it certainly did not, we weren't the ones to start it. And it is, a, it's also a racist construct, but it's very interesting that the very, you know, the very institution, uh, the very institution of folks who created the, con the construct of race are now trying to say they don't see it. And this is this is this can be very polarizing, and there are a number of uh, there are a number of of books and a number of resources that you can um, you know that you can tap into to further understand if there was something that you didn't understand fully about racism before. But um, again, when we talk about going up against these institutional, uh, these institutional constructs and in these, in these institutional factors, um, we are working with, we are working with what, you know, we were dealt. And so to see that there are, to come into these spaces and have them almost completely dismissed as if they don't matter or they don't play a part into why there are either fewer atheists of color that are represented or the number of atheists that atheists of color that may or may not attend your events, um, that would be a good resource, um, Dr. Penn's book, because those things do matter. And it also too, we've seen a number of, of people that we've seen a number of, we've, we've seen folks who once we start speaking to um, specific demographics, there's a huge backlash as to, well, well, I'm white, I go through this too. And that goes into centering whiteness when, when there are black atheists present. And um, also becoming defensive as if it's personal. And so this can be, again, very, very, it, it, it isn't just uncomfortable, it's also disrespectful and it can also be racist. And so, there are, you know, there are people who, you know, it's, it's okay to want to convene in spaces where you don't have to explain it about yourself. You, you don't, there are people who cannot, you don't have to explain it, but there are also people who can relate. And also I contend that it is okay for us to have our groups where we convene for if for specific purposes and for specific demographics and also continue can continue to work together. 
And it is going to be up to those who are looking to increase their diversity and inclusion efforts to seek out the work that we are doing. And also, and this is a, this is a start, you know, I do appreciate it. It is though, it is very interesting though, that, um, and, and the reason why I said that this is worth repeating is because there is, there has been a, there is, there was a body of work even before I became involved in this community. There were a number of people who were, there were a number of black folks who were speaking out. They were openly identifying as atheists. They were actually trying to build up community and they were, they were being more outspoken. So I'm not the first one to have done this. Um, and so, but I wanted to contribute to it. I wanted to contribute to the efforts. And um, so it's definitely teamwork for, for me. And when we impart a more team, uh, you know, a more team building, um, you know, um, mindset to this and also actions to it, then this is how they, they can improve. So to answer the question as to how you can improve on your diversity and inclusion efforts, um, I will say right now that um, right now you have quite a few references to start from that you can start hosting events around that and you can start um, hosting events and, uh, and um, facilitating topics that do pertain to not just people of color, but to the entire community, because I guarantee you that these issues affect all of us. And so, um, you know, diversifying your subject matter, but also to minding how you're minding how you're treating people, especially new folks, when they come into your spaces and also minding how they may look to other people. The one thing that I try to, um, that I try to convey is that we are still engaging with people and having a customer service and hospitality background, it makes a difference in how you are connecting. You cannot just expect for people just to come to you and just understand what you're trying to do there does need to be a certain level of outreach that we must do as, um, as a community and within our organizations. And so partnering and also just engaging in person. And, and uh, the one thing that I knew was important for us to do was to go into, um, you know, it was to attend either the national or the local events, because there's a lot of great information that your organizations provide and that I think is important for everyone to, to understand and, um, and to get involved with. There's a lot of good things, but again, how you, you know, how you are implementing it, how you are, how you are engaging the people who are new and how you are looking to retain them does make a difference. And so the way you can do that is, and not just to host, not just to make this one-time efforts or one-time initiatives, that's often another thing that has, that has been a problem is that, well, this, this, becomes a, this becomes a thing, maybe perhaps around Black History Month, um, that you may want to consider Black humanists, atheists, or et cetera. Or if it's just one time, that you feature a black speaker, that's just going to resolve everything, and that isn't that it. It, it there these um, how we came to our perspectives wasn't just one time. It took work, it took research, you know, it took reflection, and so how we improve our communities is going to take the same approach, and also. Um, learning how to once again decenter your whiteness and understand that this information is not um it is not to make you personally feel offended but perhaps you might want to understand how your actions may make that lone or very few people of color feel when they enter your spaces even if it isn't intentional but you still might want to consider why that can be an issue.
Also, our community, and I have said this a number of times, our community tends to pride itself on our, cap our intellectual capabilities, how many books we've read, how much we have dissected the God concept. But when it comes to relating to people, actually showing that you care about them and their well-being, and it doesn't mean that you have to, you know, check on them every single day, but just showing and having that community-based mentality, you know, very, very simple principles of hello, how are you, making eye contact. Uh, we definitely have a social deficit disorder that um you know that that we um that we deal with in our communities and some of it is due to the fact that you know some of us have felt isolated for so long and you know and some of us did do tend to have they we may tend to have some sort of you know sort of like um aspergery type tendencies right you know there are a lot of us who are very we're, we're very very intelligent and very smart but there is some work that is needed on how to actually communicate and convey and talk to people. And I say that that is a, that is a skill that we can constantly develop as a community and as individuals. And also too, um, if you see that just because we're atheists, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have let go of other baggage that has come along with being religious. And there is a lot of, there are still a lot of racist tendencies. There are still a lot of misogynistic tendencies, the, the, the harsh treatment of women, the treatment of women of color, and also the roles that we are expected to play within this community. So there's a lot of, you know, we, we are still, we're a, we're a growing community, we're a growing demographic, but the religious community does have uh, they they do have, you know, the a head start on us as it, you know, they, they, they do have, um, you know, years of developing those foundations of financial support. And so we understand that, you know, that is something that needs to be improved in our communities. But when you expect people to just you know, come in, participate, and volunteer, and support your organization, and there's still very little representation. You're not actually listening to the people who are, you know, who are, and who could be part potentially be participating. That can be a problem. And so the, the follow-up and the consistency is what needs to improve. And it, it doesn't mean that we aren't out there and it doesn't mean that we aren't mobilizing. You do have to examine and ask yourself the question of how much work am I doing to once, once we leave this religious community, how much, are we, how much are we reflecting as individuals and as a collective on how we are still carrying that religious baggage and what can we do to change it? And so, um, and, and also, if you know that you have people, because sometimes we like to debate, we love to discuss things, we love to, you know, we love to argue sometimes. For people who are coming to our groups, that can be off-putting as well, because people don't just come to always debate 24-7. And this is something that I... Um, can, I, I, I definitely suggest that all of us take a look at. And this is one of the reasons why um, we, you know, we, we sort of limit within uh, Black nonbelievers how much arguing we do. Because if we want to build up a community and build up that networking and put a more positive and show us in a more positive light, which doesn't mean that we won't have contentious conversations. But tact, me, tact is everything. It means a lot. It doesn't mean that you are, you have to be overly nice or that you're bending over backwards. But how, again, how we communicate this makes a huge difference. And so in that, and also you, um, there's nothing wrong with supporting our organizations. Now that you know we exist, 
um, there is information on us and I will read the mission of our organization. Uh, we connect with other blacks and allies who are living free of religion and irrational beliefs and might otherwise be shunned by family members and friends. And instead of accepting dogma, we seek to determine truth and morality through reason and evidence. And we do this through a number of ways. And you can find this information on our website. And uh, again, uh, because we engage with people um, up close and personal, um, we, and again, we do this through a number of ways, um, mostly through in-person events. Um, and we've actually, we actually have quite a few media appearances under our belt. And that was something that I was hoping that would be included within the introduction and the bio because our organization has been featured on outlets such as CNN. We've been featured on CBS Sunday Morning. We've been featured in Playboy. I will hold this is also the July, August 2018 edition. That was a, that was a big summer for us. Um, we've been featured on National Ge in National Geographic. And so there is, um, there are quite a few references to our organization and to our members and to the work that we have done. And so hopefully in increasing and improving your diversity and inclusion efforts, hopefully you are, um, hopefully you are inviting people, ask yourself how many people of color are involved in your decision-making processes? Do you have people of color that you invite to your boards? Um, are they, um, are you actually looking to um, reach out to those communities and not just doing so to bash their beliefs? Even though we still are dealing with a number of, we, we deal with, you know, religious privilege and we are, fight, we are fighting that almost every day. Um, I contend that for those of us, especially for those of us who identify and call ourselves humanists, that there are ways that we can convey our message to the general public and generate good dialogue and perhaps other good collaboration efforts. Uh, especially if, uh, especially as you identify as a church. Now, that could be a point of contention and um, you may find yourself, because we find ourselves fighting this as well as, as a demographic, as an organization. Um, but that doesn't mean you stop trying. Again, consistency does make all of the difference. So in that, um, uh, I will also uh, say, if you haven't seen my shirt yet, I hope all of you can see it. Uh, many of our organizers and members will pro probably own a shirt like this. Um, we hope that everyone will consider supporting our organization, supporting the work that we do. Um, there is a Portland, Oregon affiliate, which I know is very close to the Seattle area. Um, uh, you might want to consider connecting with them as well. So on the shirt, it says walking by sight, not faith, which is the slogan of our organization. Uh, it reads walking by sight, not faith. And that came from a Facebook status that I wrote back in 2011, which became such a huge, uh, it became a huge discussion. And I decided that it would be the slogan of our organization because, um, because faith is still such a huge thing in the black community. Um, there you can hear it in the, in the music, you can hear it in many of the leaders that represent our community. Faith is just such a huge thing. And even in the Bible, it says there's a passage that says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And that is, we do, we try to do the complete opposite. We don't walk by faith. Um, there are times where things will be uncertain for us. However, that is not our walk. Um, we do, uh, you know, we, we do take evidence, verification, and information very seriously. And if people, we, people need to know that if they are questioning those beliefs and if they don't believe in God, that is totally okay. And that there are others 
out there who can identify and who can relate and that we are building communities around that. And so for us, and, and it doesn't mean that it's just for black non-believers to wear and support because we often have a number of white folks who are like, well, I'm, I'm white, so this doesn't pertain to me. And once again, that is centering your whiteness um, when you really shouldn't be. Because again, um, you know, this is, and this doesn't mean, again, we are, our organization is very collaborative and we work with as many people and organizations as possible. But if you are asking the question, if you are taking it seriously, if you are taking diversity and inclusion seriously, there's going to be some pills that you need to swallow. And also, and it doesn't mean that you, that you um, it doesn't mean that your feelings should be hurt, but it is about imparting the information. Think about the way we try to communicate with our loved ones who are still believers. Think about when, how we try to um, explain um, our position. And it isn't one of anger. And, and if it is at times, that's totally fine because it is valid. But um, taking those same principles into account when you have atheists that are coming from further marginalized circumstances, these are things that you must take into consideration. And it, again, it, it simply isn't just up to us to build it or to convey that message. It is going to take a concerted effort and teamwork for us to increase our community building base and also to understand how these institutions affect all of us, how we communicate with each other, even if we aren't realizing it, is really gonna take some homework for, for folks to, uh, you know, it's really gonna take some homework and actually doing that work to deconstruct a lot of these things that we were taught and that we were indoctrinated with. And I always contend that, and because even though I wasn't raised religious, I didn't escape indoctrination. So there were things that I had to unlearn as well. And so these are things that we must take seriously if we are going to continue to uh, improve on our communities. And so I'm also now going to share a recent episode of The Thinking Atheist with Seth Andrews. Um, how many people here are familiar with, with Seth? Um, you don't have to all answer at once because I know y'all can't really hear me. But um, I'm going to share in here a link um, to, uh, to a podcast episode of his that featured not only myself, but there are a couple of folks who are on uh, you have Will Judy, who is with uh, the Houston Oasis Group and American Atheists, and Phil Session, who is with the Atheists Helping the Homeless out in San Antonio. Um, they were also guests on this podcast. And the reason why, um, and as well as myself and two of the Black Nonbelievers organizers. And um, I was, I'm, I'm very thankful. I'm always appreciative of opportunities to interview not just me, but also not just uh, also members of our organization, people who organize with us, and also people of color who are, who are um, working and who are involved with other secular organizations, but they are aware of our work and we support each other's work. And so um, again, what this shows is that, again, that the demographic is growing there are people who, there are more people of color who are getting involved, not just through black non-believers, but also through other organizations. And it doesn't take away from the work you do. Please understand that. It does not take away from your mission. It does not take away from your purpose as an organization to understand as well as incorporate the important topics that pertain to further marginalized groups. And that is going to take, again, some serious introspection and also not just the reflection, but also implementation because it doesn't work if we aren't actually doing the things for improvement. 
and with that being said, I'm also going to share the link for the uh, American Humanist Association Center for Education. Uh, it's in the chat room. There are there are courses on deconstructing white privilege and how to connect with, um, you know, how to connect more um, with, uh, you know, not just with people of color, but but understanding and deconstructing racism and 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 such. And so, um, hopefully, with this information, and this is just the starting point. This is just a starting point here. Having been involved with this with this movement for now over almost 10 years, um, it's almost exhausting to kind of think about what we have actually been doing. And um, you know, it it's 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 been it's been a beautiful experience, even through the hard times, because there are times where it almost feels like it's hopeless. <laughs> But it's also it's also important to understand the other organ and to know the other organizations that are involved with the secular community. Um, for example, me and both Phil Session, who I mentioned earlier, and who's on the call. Hey, Phil. He's on the board for Recovering from Religion, and I also facilitate a Recovering from Religion meetup in the Atlanta area. Of course, right now we don't meet in person, but. Um, they are a really, really good example of listening to the people of color who are um, getting involved and also um, also um, retaining facilitators because it does make a difference when you listen to us. It does make a difference when you take us seriously enough to implement what we say and also what we're doing. These things matter. And it may not seem as important to you to take, you know, to, to take the little things into consideration, especially how you are treating people. Because one thing we found is that some of the worst treatment that we have received were from people who called themselves our allies. And it isn't just the folks who are outright against us. It's often those who say they are on our side and that they understand the work that we do. And again, this is something that uh, we need to improve upon. So again, these are, you know, these are the things that um, should be taken into consideration and also know and understand when there is something that you cannot work on, that when there is something that is best left to those who represent that demographic. Um, knowing that there is an organization like Black Nonbelievers who can effectively bring out and increase more uh, the representation of Black atheists and also bring more folks to, um, to the, you know, to the, you know, to your groups and your organizations and to your events. Knowing and so supporting that work is important. Knowing that, okay, you're, it, you, it's, it's okay if you can't resolve all of the issues of, of the world. That, that's not what we're trying to do. We do have focuses that are of importance to us, and and that's a good, and now how we can how can how we can work on our what we do is something that is is always important to reflect on and reconsider. But knowing that there are maybe other organizations and people who can do it better is totally fine, and there's nothing wrong with learning from them. There's nothing wrong from there's nothing wrong with learning from us and there certainly isn't anything wrong with me learning from you. It has to be a reciprocal relationship here. Reciprocal relationships. This is how we continue to build on on um on on what we're doing here. And also now that you have a number of people who have subscribed to your meetup as a result of this having this particular session, which I think is great. Um, now there, there are some great opportunities, hopefully, to reach out to more people of color in your area. And I have a challenge too for the black atheists who are um, on this session. We can't just put it squarely on the shoulders of the white atheists to understand what we do and what we need to do. It is going to take more of a concerted effort 
for more of us, if you want to become involved in, in the community, whether it's through Black nonbelievers or through a local organization, all of these things take time, commitment, and dedication and consistency because that often that does tend to be, you know, a stumbling block that we face. And I speak for, you know, I speak on behalf of the organizers of the within Black nonbelievers as well as organizers within the movement because we all face the same challenge of retaining people as far as, um, you know, helping us facilitate getting involved, and we have lives, right? I'm I'm married with three children, and so, but I knew that this was something I didn't realize that when I got started that this would become my life. But now that it is, I'm damn sure I'm going to put everything I can into it because it's still important. It doesn't mean that everyone has to have the same level of dedication that I do, but if you see the importance, if you see the importance, if you understand the importance of being more inclusive within your organizations and having an organization that does represent marginalized demographics, if you want to hear more voices of women, of more young people, it is important to support the organizations, our organizations that are readily doing that because hopefully um, it will turn into a reciprocal relationship and reciprocal support. And this is something, but also while managing it at the same time, this is not gonna, this is never gonna be a perfect community. And I think that's something that we need to all understand. This is never going to be, um, this is never gonna be perfect, but we can try to make it as best and, and as good as we can, but through our human efforts, because we don't have a God to rely on anymore, or I've, I've, some of us have never had it. But for those of us, for those of you who have left God behind, um, accountability and, and doing things with our human hands is going to make a huge difference here. And it is going to take not just physical, but mental work in order to continue to do that. And understanding, even if, and there are some things you may never be able to directly understand, and it's okay to admit that. But again, that's also going to take a, a good effort in knowing that you can take yourself out of the equation and think about the other people who you may want to be involved and, and just caring because that is what community building is all about. It is about accountability. It is about holding each other up. It is about trying to improve as much as we can um, and just really, really trying to make our voices more heard and also just doing the things that we need to do that we can do just as, and even if you don't think it's much, every bit helps. And just starting to, you know, this is a good starting point. But again, the consistency, continuing to do this and, and remaining dedicated to that mission, it will make all of the difference in the world. And so with that, I know I've probably gone over the 20 minutes. There are probably some questions you may have. I know there were some questions that were posed. There were some um, there was some information that was asked and I'm gonna type them into the chat bar. So once again, I'd like to thank um, Seattle Atheist Church for having me as a guest for your, your weekly session. I hope to actually meet with you in person one day. Um, and whether it is uh, me coming to your area or if you look at our website and, and you decide that you want to attend one of our events, um, that you are certainly welcome to do so. And also to learn from the people who we feature at our events. And so that, um, you know, so, so thank you once again. And so if there are any questions that people, I'm going to look for the, um, I'm going to look for the website for Black Skeptics Los Angeles because someone did ask that question. But for the but for the questions that you have, uh, thank you very much once again. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion.